morning, everyone. And uh, just just to uh, remind ourselves, really, of um, a couple of comments I said last time. Um, th this is a, a sensitive subject to speak about because um, it's not it's not just a philosophical topic. Mm -hmm. it's, it's obviously one that's very relevant and very on our minds for many many reasons at the moment, in particular. Though, uh, of course, it's it's something that we often think about. Unfortunately, um, it's also sensitive because. Uh, to the degree that one uh, discusses explaining the phenomena, it can it can drift from uh, as one attempts to define and explain, it can drift towards um, justifying a, a a philosophy or a belief, which which obviously is is unjustifiable. And um, we'll talk more about this also. And I discussed it somewhat on on Wednesday evening when I was looking at rules of war and ethics of war. Um, in, in looking at spiritual causes, particularly of things, again, one can end up blaming the the victim, and and there's a fine line to be walked between understanding what our sources tell us. In, in one of the ways of understanding anti-Semitism is is from a spiritual root. Um, one can end up, in a sense, taking responsibility for it. Well, if it's our fault, if this is a spiritual consequence of failure. Um, so, so again, this is this is something that we need to, we need to deal with sensitively, and I'm I'm very conscious that. Uh, um, what I say has the potential to 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 also cause hurt and upset. And as I said last time, uh, anyway, the format of this year is, is does well when it's uh, when it's interactive. But particularly in this topic, um, if I say anything that that triggers disagreement or thought or hurt or anything like that, please please do let me know. Um, last time we were attempting to uh, define anti-Semitism. Uh, this is meant to be a, a philosophy setting. And uh, part of philosophy is attempting to define things. And uh, one of the difficulties we faced is 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 is, is the morphing nature of anti-Semitism, how, how it seems to morph continually. And I do want to look at, uh, in this session, at some of the variations or morphs that anti-Semitism has been through. I mentioned uh, last week uh, a sort of particular spiritual model of, of the morphing of anti-Semitism, which I just thought was interesting in terms of defining it as as uh, religious, as as uh, as as ethnic, and as uh, national in terms of us forming a nation state, and and so on. I'm not going to go through that again, but that's certainly one of the reasons why it's quite hard to to tie down. Um, it's also hard to tie down because the second half of the word is difficult to define. Semitism. Now, I should say, and we were just talking about this before. Um, I'm using anti-Semitism as anti-Semitism as a shortcut cut. I mentioned at the beginning, briefly at the beginning of last week, but may, maybe just to elaborate on it, the term is is obviously a fairly recent vintage. So in a sense, we're using it um, ahistorically when we when we reference anti-Semitism uh, before the 1800s. Uh, in addition, the term has a problem because Semitism is linked to the word shame, and shame had uh, many descendants beyond the Jews. The Semites includes. Uh, Arab people and so on. Uh, nonetheless, it's, it's the term that's used conveniently as, as anti-Jewish racism or, or however one wants to uh, define it. And perhaps the reason why it, it has its own term rather than just being called racism is because it hasn't always manifested as race. Uh, in, in a sense, even thinking about hatred as being race-driven is in some sense a new idea. Um, the hatred of Jews may have at one stage being anti-religious, at other stages anti-cultural, at other stages indeed race-linked. Persecution of Jews may have been because of them as part of a racial group, but at other stages as part of a religious group, and maybe at that point conversions to Christianity would, would have helped, whereas let's say during uh, the Nazi years it didn't. So there aren't, the problem here is, is we're trying to tie down a phenomenon that doesn't even have good language to use over it. To just call it anti-Jewish racism doesn't quite capture the phenomena. To call it anti-Semitism doesn't quite capture it. And and behind all of that is actually how do we define Jew? So if we're talking about anti-Jewish, what do we actually mean by Jew? And, and again, without veering too far off our subject, I mentioned last week, are we a race, are we a religion, are we a culture, are we a nationality, are we a family, are we an ethnicity? We, we don't quite fit any of those uh, labels neatly either. And all of that makes it very difficult to uh, to tie down. Um, I, I generated a, a lot of uh, discussion. We spent a, a fair amount of the, the share last week. Um, I, I tried to start off with, with what I thought was words of, of um, positivity in a sense, in which I, I said that whilst... On a, on, for any individual affected, um, and this is this is immensely uh, immensely painful to contemplate. The 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 danger of what's going on is extraordinary. I, I said that I felt that on an existential level, this wasn't necessarily the uh, um, 
the the uh, we, we should see this in proportion, and that generates lots of discussion. I don't, I don't want to go through that again, but I, I want to start off with a, a similarly um, a reminder of of not losing, in my view, not not over exaggerating the problem either. And this may can raise disagreement, but uh, nonetheless, I, I do think it's something important to say. And I think we. Um, I think we need to be careful. This is not really a philosophical point, but I'm, I'm conscious that this discussion, uh, I, I said to someone actually after the year last week that what I had thought would be a philosophical discussion ended up in many ways, at least for me, and I think for many others also, as almost a group therapy discussion, because when do we get the chance actually to sit around the table as, as a shul, as a kela, as, as friends, and talk about something that's very painful for all of us and something that we're really suffering from. And uh, I, I appreciate the next comments I'm making also in a sense beyond the realm of philosophy, but I think they're, they're worth saying. Um, I, I think we have to be careful not to uh, think that we are descending, sinking into this, this you know, pool, this 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 marsh of of overwhelming anti-Semitism, and and just be be aware of of proportionality within it. Um, I'm nervous saying this because one act of anti-Semitism is one act too many. And, and the, the rate of anti-Semitism is shockingly high and, and profoundly scary and problematic. I, I don't mean to minimize that in the least. I equally want to say, though, that uh, we're living in a country where, thank God, the vast majority of the country are, are, are not anti-Semitic and care very deeply about, about these things. And the, the statistics, the surveys bear this out. And, uh, and we, 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 sh we should focus also on what it means to live and what is a Malkus Shal Chesed and what is a wonderful corner of the world. Certainly, if we look at the sweep of Jewish history and Jewish geography, uh, we continue to live in a golden age where, where we can walk the streets safely and where we, um, even if we are sometimes disappointed with the police's reactions, where we can turn to the police and the government and, and be assured of, of, uh, of protection. I, I, I say this simply to... Again, just to to put this in context, and I, I appreciate that in the modern era, the idea that we still have to talk about anti-Semitism, the idea that there's any anti-Semitism is shocking. But equally, if we if we have a sense of the historical experience of Golos, we should know that we are living in in good times. Um, a hundred years ago, many of our ancestors living in in, in North Africa, in the Middle East, in the, in the Pale of Settlement, in, in in Eastern Europe, had no one to turn to. There, there wasn't a government to turn to. The government was the enemy. There wasn't the idea that you could turn to the police and and demand protection, even if the police don't always live up to their, their expectations of the protection they should deliver. There, there wasn't this concept of of the police or the government being your friends. They were part of the problem, part of the enemy. And quite literally, Claudius Roll was Ser Echad, one lamb. Being Shivim's Avon between seventy wolves, and and we're living in a time where we don't quite have that sentiment, where where we do feel we can turn to the the government for 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 protection and and safety, and and we we should be grateful for that. We should appreciate that. I was I, I said to someone this week. I, I, I forgive me if I'm repeating this. I don't remember if I've shared it in public, but um, a, a couple of years back, I was walking along the street uh, on a Friday night actually, and it was a a horrible rainy windy Friday night, really a, a horrible evening. And as I walked past a bus stop, my hat got blown off and it was thrown into the road and cars were passing. It was quite a good chance. It was dark. It was quite a good chance of a car going over it and it landed in a puddle. And um, a lady at the bus stop stepped forward and jumped forward and uh, um, picked up the hat and brushed it down and handed it back to me. And I thanked her and then I got talking to her and she said, um, she, she was from uh, Lithuania, a Lithuanian lady, and she handed the hat back to me. And um, I was thinking after this encounter, as I carried on walking down the road, that 100 years ago, 150, 130 years ago, my, my family on one side comes from Lithuania, Lithuanian Russia. Um, her great great grandfather would, would have knocked the hat off my great great grandfather in the street. Quite literally. I mean, that, that was the lived experience. And, and now we sort of take it for granted that, that she did what every civilized human should, be, should do and picked it up and handed it back to me. And um, we, we do need to remember that we, we live for Hashem in, in good times and, and we do need to keep focus on that. Um, I also want to say that I, I think we need to be careful not to perceive anti, uh, in, not to perceive indifference as anti-Semitism, and maybe there's also some little bit of self-reflection that we should engage in in this part of what I'm saying. Um, first of all, and I, I did mention this last week. First of all, as Rabbi Herman said when he spoke Friday night very beautifully a couple of weeks back, um, I don't think a lot of our our colleagues in work and uh, the people we met with 
and uh, our neighbours appreciate the degree to which this this just causes us profound distress and profound pain, and the degree to which we feel linked to Israel, or quite literally linked first of all by ties of friendship and family. We all have such a vast number of, of close relatives there, but even on on a even if we didn't, and even to the degree that we don't, just the level in which we we feel like a family and we're we're a small people, and there's this very very deep sense of connection. Um, I, I don't think it, it occurs to people that there's this deep pain. I think a lot of our colleagues and neighbours and so on are, are uncomfortable. They're not sure what it's legitimate and what way it is legitimate to say things to us. I think we experience this on a very personal level when people go through loss. We often don't know what to say and, and sometimes we almost avoid speaking to someone who's been through loss or going through difficulty because it, it makes us uncomfortable. We're not sure how to handle it. And on a national level, people just simply aren't sure what to say. Um, we, we, we rightly get a little upset when, when people say to us, we'll assume you may have had this encounter where someone assumes, well, you must have come from Israel if you're Jewish or, or you know, you can't really be English. But then if we, if we are really English, it, I think people struggle to understand, you know, just, nonetheless, we feel very connected to Israel. We, 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 we defend ourselves against claims of, um, and correctly so again, we're, we're Jews living in the diaspora. We're not responsible for every policy of the Israeli government, but we yet feel this very, very close in, in connection with Israel. And it brings out the difficulty, really. We, we, we ourselves struggle to define what we are and to what degree is a Jew of the, of the diaspora still in some ways a citizen of Israel. And, and Kalbus, I mean, how much more so for, for our, our colleagues who are not Jewish, who, who haven't spent anywhere near the amount of time that we have obsessing what it means to be Jewish and how we relate to Israel, to, to be a little uh, confused about this. Um, we, we, we see ourselves as having a voice in some ways in, in what goes on in Israel, because as Jews, we all stakeholders in it. And, and how we balance that with other aspects of our identity, I think, is often a little uh, confusing. Um, I think also, and I'll come back to this in a minute, I think the average uh, person, non-Jew, knows quite little about what's going on in Israel, really. And you, you just you, you can see that just by observing someone uh, in the olden days, I don't know if people remember this, but many years back, see Zoom, people used to travel on the Zoom and they used to read newspapers. Uh, made out of paper rather than just on their phones. Anyone remembers this back in the 1800s? So, uh, um, and you can see that when people read newspapers, right? They, they, they would pick up a newspaper, glance very briefly at the front page and the headlines. I'm not saying everyone, but many people, and then swiftly turn to the crosswords or the, or the sports page, depending on what their, what their interests were. Um, I think many people know as much about Israel uh, and the conflict in, in Israel as we do about the Hutus and Zutsis in, in Central Africa. Um, they just, it's just, it's just, two tribes somewhere fighting about some piece of territory they're not really that clear on and uh and it's just another another news item um and and the, I, I want to come back to that point in a few minutes when i talk about something else anti as well now i'm talking about indifference not anti as well just indifference um and the final point i want to make about indifference which i do think there's there's a little bit of muscle for us in is um and forgive me for saying this but a, a degree of indifference that that we we sometimes slip into about tragedies and conflicts in other parts of the world and um, we do care. Look, we, we started saying to him in the shul at the time of the Ukraine conflict, and we were conscious of it. We, we had uh, a talk here in the shul about the Uyghurs, many, I think several years back already, as when, you know, we, we, we do care and we should care, um, but we care a certain amount, and then we, we get on with our lives. And, 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 and again, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not criticizing that profoundly. It's, it's just a way of coping. If, if you look at the amounts of tragedies and conflicts across the world, you just need to screen them out. Otherwise, one just gets overwhelmed. But um, we, we're willing to dedicate a certain amount of energy to care. And then, and then we get you know, pressed under the weight of life. And you know, we, we, we're, we're more focused on paying our mortgage than on, on, on other things. And um, I think we need to recognize that, that, that maybe, maybe we can do a bit better in terms of empathy towards others. And uh, certainly, I, I don't think we can assume anti-Semitism when there's indifference to some degree to our own uh, our own suffering. And that's the first point I wanted to make, and say, and I, I hope I'm quite upset by saying this. I, I think it needs to be said. Um, the second point I, I want to say is that that's particularly because of how little people know about the conflict. The second point I mentioned, um, that's it's about the Hutus and Tutsis to most people. I, I don't think I think that much anti-Israel sentiment. Um, and again, I'm, I'm, there, there are, I'm labelling with one brush anti-Israel, and there are shades of anti-Israel sentiment out there. And some of it very clearly is driven by hate, very profound hate, and very deep hate, and, and hate that either is anti-Semitism, or at least has become very caught up in the, 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 the Islamist uh, project and other various sources like that. Um, but I think some level of anti-Israel sentiment is simply because people know very little about it. And therefore, they simply look at the headlines and they can't see beyond the headlines and they're not bothering to invest in any more research than just the headline numbers. And I, I remember in the last conflict uh, a couple of years back, um, 
I think the ratio or somewhere around 960, I think, is uh, uh, Palestinian deaths. I think 40 Israeli deaths. It was, it was just missiles. It wasn't an, uh, uh, um, the Israeli army didn't go in on the grounds into Gaza. And um, I, I remember just listening to an interview in which the, the Israeli spokesman or, or whoever it was who was speaking was trying to make certain points. And the presenter kept on saying, yes, but 960, 40, 960, 40, 960, 40. And he just couldn't see, couldn't see past the numbers. And um, it, it may be inexcusable for a journalist not to bother seeing past numbers. And maybe for anyone who, who dares voice a view on a conflict, not to see past numbers. But the reality is most people form a judgment very quickly and don't bother um, putting much thought into it and, and therefore struggle to see past the numbers. And the sort of argument, and, and I think this is an outrageous argument for anyone who, who thinks about it at all, but the argument, well, one Palestinian life is worth as much as one Jewish life, which is, which is absolutely correct. And therefore, why, you know, okay, Israel suffered terribly with the loss of its children, but why, why does that justify the loss of Palestinian children? I think for someone who hasn't invested seriously in the argument is... Is, is 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 sounds very convincing until one actually probes deeper and, and understands the, the 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 complete contrast between um, a society deliberately tar targeting children for 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 no credible reason whatsoever, driven by hatred, driven by, by destruction, as opposed to a, an army which is desperate to minimise destruction, that deeply is is scared of, if if for nothing else, PR reasons, but obviously for more moral reasons also, every single Palestinian death. But but the, people just look at the headlines and 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 based on that arrive at a rushed um conclusion. Now I'm I'm bothering saying this for, for two reasons. Number one, because um we shouldn't feel that we are we are overwhelmed by uh, a wave of anti-Semitism. And I think it is important that we appreciate these things. And secondly, because it affects the nature of our communication outwards. And some of us are communicating with outside world, some of us aren't, some of us have colleagues who, who are involved in this, some of us are writing uh, um, pieces, public pieces in, in an attempt to communicate wider. Everyone has their own sort of involvement with communication. But I just I want to say that when we do communicate, we need to do so, I think, from a point of understanding that as frustrating as it is, and, and one reads pieces and one just wants to tear one's hair out with frustration, Frustration at at like the depth of lack of thought and misunderstanding and 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 facile comparisons between between what Hamas does and what Israel does and, and it's just it's just it, it's so soul destroying and and energy draining and paralyzing and frightening that people are making these comparisons. I don't mean to minimize any of that, but I do mean to say that we 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 don't gain. I think by taking a, a strident tone sometimes in responding and sometimes if we if we label someone an anti-Semite. Who, who, to the depth of their being, doesn't think they are one or doesn't feel one. It just weakens our term when we do need to label people as, as anti-Semites. Now, I want to say, obviously, there comes a certain point where, with all the limits of us in the world, and with all this understanding of lack of of, of superficiality and lack of understanding, someone ends up as a functioning anti-Semite because the fact is, given how they're processing the data, they're ending up as anti-Jewish, and that, that is dangerous and needs to be responded to. And, and such a person is anti-Semitic, whether they recognise it or not. But I think there are many people who haven't, in my humble opinion, have not crossed that threshold, and and very profoundly do not see themselves as as racist or anti-Semitic. And, and we need to be careful just in terms of communication, if nothing else. Um, the final point I, I want to make in terms of, of sort of why I think we slip between the gaps um, is, is in a way the scariest point. It's also a sensitive point because it gets a little bit into modern day politics and I don't really want to get drawn into modern day political divide. Um, but the reality is that for lots of reasons, um, our culture in general and in particular parts of the, the left or far left um, have embraced an ideology of of uh, victimhood, and again, I don't mean to say that everyone on the left is is, is anti-Israel, anti-Semitic, and and anything of the sort. I'm, I'm not, but but there there is an ideology of embrace of victimhood, and um, unfortunately, and we're often frustrated. Why is it that every other type of victim is cared about and not Jews? But but again, on a very profoundly superficial level, not more on there, but but on a very superficial level. Um, it, it, Jews don't tick the box of superficial victimhood um, from a superficial point of view, because most of us look quite white, and from a more in-depth point of view, because the Jews they know, they see as powerful, they see their, their colleagues in, 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 in their industry, they're in politics, they're in business, 
um, they, 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 that's on a personal level. And on a national level, they see Israel as a powerful country. It's a regional superpower. And, and it is in some ways, Baruch Hashem, right? We're grateful for that. And, and yes, we know because we understand the, the nuances behind the story that it's also a very vulnerable country with a tiny strip of land at its, you know, at its narrowest points, just several miles wide, surrounded by a, a far greater population. We, we understand that. But on the other hand, it, 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 you know, Israel rightly, and we need to do that for our own self-confidence and, and for Israel's belief in itself correctly, so has to celebrate its, its outstanding min and miraculous military successes and intelligent coups and the like. But the, the, the flip side of that is that, that at least since 67, Israel has shifted from... Pre-67, by the way, the analogy used when the people used to speak about uh, David and Goliath, it, it was Israel that was the David and, and the surrounding Muslim world was, was the Goliath. But the analogy has flipped in, in, the, in the decades that have passed, um, and we no longer tick the, the victimhood box. Now, again, I, I want to emphasize there comes a point where... If someone is full of illusions about what it means to be a Jew, they, they end up as a functional anti-Semite, 100%. And at that point, do need to be called out for that and labeled as such. But the, again, we, I think it's important for us to recognize the journey and how this changes. When we talk about the morphing ideology of anti-Semitism, we need to come back to that because it's scary and worrying and frightening and, and perhaps in line with the, the morphing virus of anti-Semitism that yet again, we find ourselves slipping through the gaps. And just when society has become really con conscious of victimhood and, and looking out for those who are vulnerable, suddenly we don't fit the box of vulnerability. And yet again, anti-Semitism can rear its ugly head. So uh, there is a problem in this, but I do think we need to recognize where, where and label it and identify it properly and recognize where it comes from. And um, again, there clearly is a point at which it steps over a line. And, and in, in my view, you know, the Corbyns of the world and so on have stepped over the line, even if he is completely sincere when he says, I'm not anti-Semitic. And, and maybe he believes what he's saying. But there comes a point where people have spun themselves so many illusions about Jewish power and how Jews operate. Now, the, the, there is someone, and I, I, I don't say in public in the recording, I'm, I'm happy to share after this, someone who runs a business very near to this shul. Um, who, who, a non Jewish fellow, who, who told me with, with complete conviction that all Jews are wealthy. And um, I don't even know if he said it sneeringly, maybe he even said it positively, I'm not sure. And, and it just staggered me that somebody who lives in our area um, and trades with Jews constantly, and, and we, we provide clientele, had, had, this, had this image of, of, and is in a business where they actually see how, how Jews operate, had this image that we're all wealthy. Um, so it does come a point where, where illusions and, and delusions about what it means to be a Jew, of course, step over the line. But, but again, I, I do think it's worth us just understanding this phenomena of, of, why, um, of, of why we don't take that victim box um, and why certainly indifference and even to some degree anti-Israel sentiment isn't, isn't always overtly or obviously driven by anti-Semitism, sometimes sincerely isn't. And, and that needs to colour how we uh, how we how we label our response. So forgive me for saying this. I know I know probably what much of what I said reflects everyone's views around this. But having had lots of conversations with people in the in the Kahila, um over the last weeks, I, I just felt a, a need to sort of start off saying this. And uh, I, I don't know if anyone uh, wants to comment on this or if we can move on back to the the more philosophical uh, part of this. Yeah. Um, I, 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 It's a lot of something that we said that is not going to hold. Is it that even if an individual were realized to be swayed, or any of the other reasons, it's not something that we said that we should be philosophy. Or what I'm So I, I will come to Jewish philosophy and the Hashkafa of Jewish obsession. A hundred percent, both hashkafically and in terms of Jewish philosophy and our sources, and in terms of the phenomenon itself, a hundred percent. There's an obsession with everything that Jews do, and and in the same week as as uh, in the same weeks as this is going on, tragically, there's there's bombardment of of Arabs by by their own government taking place in Syria. There's a vast array of Muslim deaths in in, in natural disasters in Afghanistan far greater numbers barely reported that there's a hundred percent of Jew, Jewish obsession again though I simply want to say that obsession with Jews isn't it, it doesn't equate with anti-semitism though it is dangerous and needs to be dealt with and needs to be understood both philosophically as we will do and practically I'm, I'm, I'm making a point both in terms of our own morale and in terms of how we communicate things uh, we need to in my view target our response appropriately in order to uh, in order to to um, and to get the message across, um, may, maybe actually given your comments, I'll, I'll, I'll conclude before I go back to philosophy with one thought around how we communicate things, but I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute, sorry. Okay. I mean, I think yeah. on this, 
The point is, we are unique because we are a religion, we are a race, and yeah. we're a nation. And I don't think other people can understand. Yeah. And some of our enemies, I think, sincerely believe we are only really the Arabs, for example, the Muslims. Yeah. It was Muslims spread all over the world that they can't, you know, uh, communicate the fact that we we've got this piece of land to be saved and so and it, and I'm far bit for me to defend your record, but I think we do also think we're a religion, and therefore we you know that's why it says we're colonial invaders in I, I I agree with you, and I think that there comes a point where I, I want to say two points. I think there comes a point where we have to recognise that no matter what depth of understanding we have and where people come from, they've crossed over the border for Lemaisa, Tachlis, practically speaking, this is anti-Semitism and they're anti semitic And I, I sincerely believe that, that Corbyn has crossed that threshold. At 100%, we need to be able to call that out when someone do does. Even though I equally think, I think it's probably true when he protests and says I'm not an anti-Semite, that he believes it. I, I think he really believes it. I think that's one of the reasons why this is obstinacy. I think he means that there's not an anti-Semitic bone in my body, there's not a racist bone in my body. What do you mean? I spent my whole life fighting racism. But it's, it's not the point. There comes a point where someone has crossed over on a functional level, for whatever reason, if someone believes enough enough myths about Jews, then they are anti-Semite. Even if we can explain why they believe these myths, and maybe they're not even in a sense to blame for believing this. Maybe, maybe they've just been fed propaganda or whatever. That they are believing these myths, and that's that's a problem. That's that's and I don't mean to diminish that, um, but but I, I do think there's 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 people in in some sort of vague middle territory, which is a little hard to define, where, where we need to make a best attempt to still try and, and communicate with some degree of empathy, the complexities. The problem is it's very difficult when people aren't willing to think. They're willing to take a very, very strong stance based on 15 seconds of thought. And that is that is where, where Israel's being hammered and slammed, unfortunately. Yeah, sorry, Gary. Uh, um, I, I, I struggle with that because I think it's much less... That's, we do have to call it out, and even if even if it's uh, even if they're from a position of ignorance, but if you call it out as, as, as anti-Semitic, someone who may who may not believe that they are, and they're in a court, maybe saying, "Well, I'm just protesting whatever," it is, actually may be shocked and go back and think about it. By the way, if you try and rational, rationalize it without shocking them with this, this is how we perceive it as anti-Semitism, then. You're never going to go in. I think that's a fair point. I, I think there's always a fine line between two, two things first I want to say. One is call it out 100%. This is not an, a, a plea to people not to call things out. We have to call things out. I'm simply saying when we call it out, sometimes let's call it out as ignorance rather than, than anti-Semitism. The second point is, I, I think you're right, some people will, are shocked when one calls something out with strident terms. May, maybe this final point is, is, a, is a psychological point or communication point and should be left to experts who know about these things, and I don't. My, my, my personal feeling is that when one needs to give people space to reflect, and when, when they're very heavily attacked, they, they often move into defensive mode or cease to hear the counter-argument. Whereas if one, if one comes with, with a little more empathy in the in the attack or the criticism or the I, I often use an analogy i will be speaking wednesday night when i'm talking about ethics of warfare about the halacha of um, not surrounding besieging a city on all four sides and even an escape route and i found in communication with people actually giving someone an escape route to preserve their dignity if, if you really want the outcome if, if one's goal is is the sort of i told you so and the victory then not living live, leaving someone room to to leave with dignity intact is, is you then don't need someone with room to leave with dignity intact but if the goal is to get someone to change their minds in my view it's much better if they can emerge saying i never really meant that but I've changed. you know let them change their mind if someone consistently says anti-semitic stuff and every time after they defend it they never meant it they, they obviously that ceases to be a justification if someone has once said something and and can can leave with dignity intact and say i didn't understand this i didn't mean this it was taken too far i should have been more careful in their speech i i think everyone deserves to get out jail free card once and 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 should be given a chance to to not be tarred uh with, with something but but again i i i i appreciate your point that sometimes one just has to say something in in, in, a, in a in the most uh, significant way yeah sorry it's yeah. going circle with someone like antonio good who's supposed to know all the ins and outs, and yet he can come out with a statement like that. Is that anti-Semitic, or is it just a total lack of uh, uh, um, awareness of the situation? But it's just, it just seems to go against the grain of sense. I, I, I don't know, and there, there are problems with, again, there's a point at which one has to 
as much as I'm talking like this, one has to stop psychoanalyzing one's, one's enemies. And I say on a functional level, if someone is so super biased consistently against Israel or against Jews, then then this is functional anti-Semitism. I don't know enough about his writing to know at what point, uh, where it crosses the threshold. I, I'm not, I, I, I so far from knowing all the answers, I really don't know. I'm, I'm simply saying, putting forward that when, I think we should think more carefully and, and think about what point something crosses the threshold of anti-Semitism, at least on a functional level, before before we label it. And my instinct is that we we do damage by over quickly labeling something. Though I appreciate your point, sometimes one just needs to shake someone up. And and but when you're saying something to someone who, who profoundly where you profoundly think they're wrong, you don't listen to them. And and if 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 uh, I think we've all been in this experience where 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 someone tars us with an accusation, if you think it's got no truth to it whatsoever, you're just not going to waste time thinking about it. If you know you're not anti-Semitic, then you're not going to take it seriously, and you'll take less seriously the claim of of anti-Semitism against someone else. Yeah, sorry. I think we're just feeling dominated by, yeah. just, you know, today's news, basically. I mean, yes. I think it's not philosophical basis, I think we're getting away from We have got away from philosophy. I think that's 100% true. I, I said I'm beginning this as a little bit of group therapy, yes. I'm using this a bit as a platform because it's one of the, the chances I have to speak to the community about these things. And and I it hit me after the, the amount of comments I got after the last session and then after Wednesday and just general conversation. It hit me that it was and it was important to find a forum to talk about these 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 things in public. Um, by the way, I'm, I'm not trying to plug anyone, but we, we had an example of what I thought was very effective communication, actually, in your Instagram uh, Instagram post. And uh, there, there, there's some very beautiful, effective communication out there, which I, I think exactly adopts this tone of empathy, in which is trying to tell a narrative and actually just share what we're feeling. Um, there, there, there are, there's much good communication going on, both both privately, not, not professional journalists, anything like that, and by professional journalists. But I think we have to... Uh, um, and, and and you were one of the people who shared feedback with me, right? And shared thoughts. I I, I just I'm using this somewhat. I'm hijacking somewhat the philosophy around Samson because it hit me last week that it, there, there was the, there was so little conversation going on around this community that it, there's lots of private conversations going on, but not in a bigger forum. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> Whereas I was disturbed by your focus on potentially being able to correct or form people who might express this still not exclusively by any means, but I think more embedded in terms of excitement. I think there is a significant element here where it is Absurd and without doubt impossible to try to convince somebody that their own religious fundamentalist beliefs, even if they don't express them themselves, but, um, contradict or are in defiance of Judaism. And the problem, as I see, is that I'm only speaking now in terms of the free of monotheist religions, and I'm not using them, I know nothing about those. Seems to me that we have got a, an imbalance because whereas Judaism seems to be quite able and capable of accepting and in fact in some cases encouraging other monotheistic religions, it doesn't seek to convert. Um, it's not in modern times, um, and therefore can live quite happily with divergent beliefs in many areas. Um, at the essence of the other two monotheistic religions, that I don't believe is the case. Okay, so I, 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 yeah. To suggest to somebody you can convince them that the essence of their religion uh, is faulty or flawed seems to me to be a, an impossible task. Okay, so so I was asked actually online just to repeat the question. Um, um, the question is, is first of all, some degree of, of I think, um, being disturbed by what I'm saying, and the sense that there are in, in other Abrahamic faiths aspects that are sort of so fundamental to religious belief that, that there's there's almost emerging from that uh, anti-Semitism and the impossibility of convincing people of that, uh, given that these are very deeply held religious beliefs. So I, I will come on to um, religious sources of anti-Semitism still today. That, that's my plan. And I, I want to get back to some philosophical stuff, so I, I will address that. <laughs> Online, there's two points. One is um, from, uh, um, I'm trying to see if it was sent to everyone or just to me, whether I should say shame Omri or not. Um, 
Okay, I can't see if it is or not. So, as the Jew hatred as a term captures precisely the concept. I was saying anti-Semitism is a bit of a flawed term. And uh, someone else wrote reference and difference. It's very much what happened during the Cambodian massacres, only brought to our attention by the film The Killing Field. Many, many examples where we are where we are effectively indifferent to what's going on in, in the rest of the world, either through ignorance or just not knowing. Um, I, I want to maybe just um, let, let's let's move on and, and actually just shift a bit towards uh, what, what the sort of philosophy of anti-Semitism. I, I mentioned last week that anti-Semitism is it, it's very difficult to pin down because it seems to morph constantly. And I just want to, in a sense, give an overview of some of the big um, shifts in, in anti-Semitism over, over the centuries as, as it morphs from point to point. And if we have time, I would like to come to a conclusion that actually philosophically is very hard to tie down anti-Semitism and probably makes sense to think of it on a more functional level. In other words, we, we can think, give clues that indicate this is anti-Semitism without necessarily being able to define it in, in a strict sense. Um, much of what I'm going to say now is is not from my own knowledge. I, I wish I knew history like this, but um, it's really just a collation of other things I saw all over the place. And I didn't particularly write it out to shame Omro in, in, uh, in, in, in the name of who said it. But I don't think there's anything particularly innovative in, it, in any of this. It's just it's just reminding us of things that we vaguely know and running through it. So um, one of the and, and what I'm going to say now is, is is difficult in today's day and age, but it should be said. And, and I, I don't say this as a sweeping condemnation of, of every Christian or of, of Christianity as a faith in general, but I think we just should be honest about this. One, one of the strongest sources of classic anti-Semitism um, in, in, since in, over the last 2000 years was in, uh, was, in, was in religion. And I'm going to start off and talking about origins of Christian anti-Semitism. Um, I, I'm always a little nervous saying any of this because the truth is I, I don't know that much about Yiddishkeit and Kabbalah I don't know that much about Christianity or Islam. And I, I mean that sincerely, that it, it's quite easy to mine sources and find quotes here and there and, and use them to prove points. Um, we know that within our own faith, uh, there are quotes that either are, are genuine and legitimate quotes, but aren't to be understood in that way or don't apply nowadays around our Malik and, and uh, the Shivas Amin and, and, and the like. And if someone doesn't understand Torah Shabal Peh and practical application of Halacha, they can say these are legitimate quotes. And then there are illegitimate quotes where someone cuts sort of four words from a Gemara to prove a point of, of let's say, profound anti-non-Jewish sentiment or the like, where the quote is just a complete misunderstanding and it's just literally cutting the quotes. So what, given that introduction, I say everything hesitantly, and I, I, I recognize that within Christianity, particularly uh, post the Second uh, Vatican Council and other things, there have been some re rereading of these sources. But I feel OK to quote these because it is a historical fact that many, many Christians for, for 2000 years did understand these sources this way. And they were used in, in, in anti-Jewish sermons to, to promote uh, anti-Semitism, though as the, that's an anachronistic term, and definitely that was linked to religion and and his history of religious hatred. And and we should know this just as as educated Jews. Um, in many ways, one can almost say the New Testament canonized anti-Semitism. And uh, the, the most famous quote, perhaps, around all of this is in in, in Matthew: "Let the bloods be on our on our heads and heads of our children." This sort of quote that Jews supposedly said, where the bloods of the founders of Christianity was on our heads. Um, there's, there's the frustration expressed in, in John, where, where he basically said Jews are the devil. He's frustrated. Why can't they hear what I'm saying? Why are they so obstinately refusing to hear my message? Why don't you understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of the Father, the devil, and you will to do your Father's desire. The reason why you do not hear the words of God is because you are not of God and so on. This idea that somehow Jews are, are profoundly of the Satan, profoundly of the devil. Um, and, and then later, um, fathers of, Christia, of, of, of the Christian faith, not, not canonized in, in the New Testament, Oregon famously, um, we say with confidence that Jews will never be formed, uh, uh, restored to their former condition. They committed a crime of the most unhallowed kind, the worst crime ever performed by human beings, was deicide, the murder of God. So the, these are very, um, very uh, profoundly, uh, very profoundly embedded into, into aspects of early, um, early Christianity. What's often missed in, in when we talk about Christian anti-Semitism is that around the year 1000, the condition of Jews took a turn for the worst in Christian Europe. And whilst Christian anti-Semitism for the first thousand years was unpleasant, and there was persecution, um, the association of the sort of internalization of this message that Jews weren't just competitors and unbelievers, but were 
satanic and demonic and devilish um, really started only in, in the second millennia of, of European. And, and Ju the Jewish experience really took a turn for the worst um, around the, 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 the turn of the millennia. And in particular um, here, uh, an English export, of course, the blood libel in in uh, in 1144 in um, in Norwich. I, I think historically the first blood libel, as far as I understand. And um, yeah, oh, that, yes, yeah, okay, the, the hundred, yeah. The, it, it, that, that's why I said I labelled it as it was the re-emergence or the internalisation of this idea that Jews are satanic. So even though it's there in Christian doctrine that Jews are satanic, in, in as I said, in Oregon in in whatever year it was in in in, in uh, 185 into the Common Era, wherever it is, it sort of hasn't entered, trickled into mass consciousness till till the second millennium of Christianity. And at that point, it does enter into mass consciousness. And unfortunately, every year after that, um, increased uh, messaging around Jews as, as taking this, this animalistic pleasure in the murdering of Christian babies and in drinking their blood and everything else that emerged from this. And later, of course, this was a Christian export to uh, to the Middle East. And uh, and this sort of ideology was adopted by some uh, um uh, some uh, adopted by, by some Muslims. Um, as late as uh, 1880s, you sort of see see claims around this. Um, I've just got a quote here. Every practicing Hebrew worthy of the name is obliged even now in conscience to use to food and drink and sacrifice and various other rites of religion. Fresh or fried blood of Christian child. This is 1882, a quasi-Vatican publication. Um, in the war, um, again, new information is emerging now about complicity or otherwise of, of Catholics to, in, in the Holocaust, but quotes from, from senior church figures in which uh, um, in which deportation of the Jews and murder of the Jews was justified as a punishment for, for the killing of, of, of the, the Christian saviour and the like. So uh, um, so so I just I don't feel if we're talking about anti-Semitism, we can ignore Christian roots of anti-Semitism. Um, similarly, again, and I'm conscious again, the same thing that, that the the it, it, it's easy to mine any body of work for selective quotes, and uh, the, the the Muslims have explicitly a, a almost Torah pair equivalent of of some of the quotes of the Hadith, which uh, different ones have different degrees of authority and so on. So I, I don't mean to say that every Muslim who's true to the Quran has to understand all these things in, in the worst possible understanding, but um, it, it is again a, a fact, a historical fact that. Uh, Muhammad felt betrayed by um, the lack of acceptance by Jews on the Arabian Peninsula of his message and turned uh, anti-Jewish at one stage. Um, initially, he saw himself as an ally of the Jews. He was bringing monotheism to the largely pagan Arab tribes. And, and he almost saw himself as, as, I'm just continuing the Jewish message. I'm on your side, guys. I'm, I'm with, we're doing the same thing. But when his message was rejected by the Jews, um, th 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 there is a, a distinctly anti-Jewish sentiment that creeps into some of the messages in the Quran. A again, I, I really can't comment on how widely he spread this is, this is understood in this way, whether there are alternative ways of understanding it. But the, the words just, just read... Uh, um, it reads... It, it, very significantly anti-Semitic. On account of the breaking of their covenant, we cursed them and made their hearts hard. But Allah, God, has cursed them, the Jews, on account of their unbelief. They didn't believe but a little. So they do believe a little bit, but not 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 too much. Um, and uh, humiliation and wretchedness was stamped upon them, and they were visited with the wrath of Allah. That's because they disbelieved in his revelations and slew the prophets wrongly. So there, there's, a, there's a sort of buying into aspect of both the Christian stories of, of how he slew the prophets and and his own version uh, version of that. And um, again, in uh, um, and again, obviously, I, I don't even need to quote um, from leading uh, representatives of the Muslim world. Unfortunately, um, some shocking uh, anti-Semitic things come out. Um, a repetition of some Christian libels really being repeat, repeated by, uh, I think, in, in the 80s, the Saudi Arabian uh, ambassador to the UN literally quoted the blood, blood libel as, as something from the Talmud. The Talmud instructs all Jews that once a year, as a minimum, you have to drink uh, non-Jewish blood. And Hamas, I think, in its charter um, has 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 literally elders of Zion type conspiracy stuff around Jews. Um, the Jews were behind the French Revolution, the Communist Revolution, behind World War One, behind World War Two. We really messed up with that one, but okay. Um, through it, they made huge financial gains by by trading armaments, paved the way. There's no war going, on. and then they reference their plan is embodied in the protocols of the elders' design. So it's, it's embodied in the in the Hamas Charter that the elders of the, the original charter in the 1980s. Yes, yes, yeah, which they claim they changed and <laughs> to back. Yeah, this is it's fair, but I'm quoting from the 1988 charter. Yeah. So th this is this is just unfortunately reminding us of 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 some. Um, of some of the stuff out there. 
So we've spoken so far about really, I, I think, two morphs in, in the modern era, in, in, sorry, not in the last two millennia, um, from the sort of classic religious anti-Semitism of Jews having spiritual failures, which was perhaps the first millennia, um, and the second millennia in the Christian world, in which this moved from just religious failures to almost an embodiment of satanic and devilish behavior. The third morph, um, happened, third change in anti-Semitism really happens in the Enlightenment. So the Enlightenment, it should be a time of, of the ending of anti-Semitism. Um, the, the, the world is moving away from, uh, um, from uh, sort of religion, religious views as being the only way of, of understanding the world. And you have um, great thinkers, uh, Voltaire, right? The Enlightenment sometimes referred to as the age of Voltaire and, uh, and uh, Kant, who's who, really clear thinkers who are talking about human reason. And um, it shifts then from being, uh, and, and by the way, a new word at that point is invented. And, and I think Sachs makes this point, talking about this before. It's in 1879 when the, the term anti-Semitism is coined because the old word for Jewish hatred is no longer quite fit for purpose because it was Christian driven religious hatred. But now we're moving away from being religious thinkers. We're, we're entering into the age of enlightenment and Jews themselves are joining in an enlightenment at least uh, to some degree or other and are losing their, their complete, you know, unquestioned loyalty to their own faith also. And we're certainly losing our, our loyalty to our faith. Or even if we're remaining religious, we're no longer allowing it to, we, we're humanists now, right? There's, there's a humanism creeping in in which we're seeing humans as the sense of reason. And yet suddenly, uh, uh, anti-Semitism goes through a morph, and this is when it begins as being associated with um, race or nationality. So Jews are an aberration because they're there in Europe, they're a different race, um, they're not the same nationality as, as us, so therefore they can't really be true Germans or true French people, and their national characteristics are profoundly uh, problematic. Famous quotes from Voltaire, they are totally ignorant nation who for many years have combined contemptible miserliness and the most revolting superstition with the violent hatred of all the nations that have tolerated them. Nevertheless, he's got, they should not be burned at the stake. Um, so he's, he's appealing for tolerance. So he's looking at Jews and he's saying, you're superstitious and ignorant uh, because your faith is, is one of superstition and, 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 uh, um, uh, and so on. Kant, who, who's difficult to pin down, and I, I don't want to tar him with the label of, of anti-Semitism, but he definitely sees Jews, and Judaism at least, as a block to the Enlightenment. And he says the euthanasia of Judaism can only be achieved by a creation of a, a mor moral religion and abandonment of, of all the old Jew Jewish legalism. So, you know, it, it's somewhat still tied to, to the old, old religion things. Um, and then, of course, now we're living in a uh, and, 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 and it was that doctrine that saw it as not religious, but as, as national or racial that allows the rise of, of, of Nazism. Again, I want to emphasize, because you, you made this point before, when, when you said there was the return of the blood libel, these things go in waves. So the, the closest figure we have in Tanakh, who seems to have almost a, a racial hatred of the Jews, or an, 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 is, is of course the figure of Homam. Who, who, who almost reads as, as a classic and as, as, as a more modern anti-Semite. They're scattered, but they hold themselves different to everyone else. So it, it is a turning of the cycle. So in, in modern European history, the sort of racial as opposed to religious formulation of anti-Semitism is, is only really a phenomenon of the Enlightenment. If we go back to classical sources, there, there were in, 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 in ancient history, there were times when you have that, that sort of expressed itself. And then, and of course, now famously today, we're we're in another mutation of anti-Semitism, which is which is uh, um, is is uh, it, it expressed itself in in anti-Zionism, in the idea that Jews should be different to everyone else. They shouldn't, they shouldn't be entitled to their own state. They shouldn't be entitled to their own nation. And you, you see here the flipping of it. In other words, the problem with Jews is that they're a separate nation. But but then the anti-Semitism morphs, and and they can no longer be called a separate nation because uh, because they shouldn't be entitled to normal national things. Why should Jews be entitled to own uh, nation state? So this is just like a whirlwind reminder of some of the classic tropes of anti-Semitism and how it's morphed through the uh, through the ages. Um, I, I want to just conclude today, and and uh, Lina, the next Sunday we will we will really begin looking properly at classic sources around this, because I appreciate it was sort of the way we've drifted away from Torah to some degree. Um, I just want to conclude today by, by, again, this is not my own definition, it was just collated from things I read, um, an attempt therefore to move away from a, a sort of philosophical definition of, of anti-Semitism to more of a functional definition of anti-Semitism. And this comes from, uh, um, I think I hadn't heard of, uh, an Argentinian uh, Israeli thinker, who, who just says, let's give up on trying to define anti-Semitism to, to philosophically, and just on a functional level, say that it stands out as unique because of the following phenomena. It has an unusual longevity. It seems to just exist through the ages. 
Um, it has something that's universal about it. Every society, unfortunately, the Jews find themselves in uh, some anti anti uh, um, anti Semitism comes in. Um, it has a permanence. In other words, it lives on in, in collective memory, even in places where Jews aren't found. It's very interesting in places where Jews have never been. Um, there are there are generally speaking limits on anti Semitism in, in those countries. In places where Jews once were, even though they've long left and are, are not really a significant part of the population, anti-Semitism uh, lingers. So there's parts of East Europe which have a tiny Jewish population, completely invisible, barely active anymore, but anti-Semitism lingers for, for a century uh, afterwards. Um, so, so, so longevity and permanence are two separate, uh, he points this out, they're, they're often confused, but really they're two separate phenomena. Um, he, he speaks about it as an intensity, it displays an unusual intensity. Um, so, again, I, I don't want to fall into the trap of comparing our ex experiences to other groups who have been victims of racism, but, but there isn't really any other ideology of any other racist driven ideology that has led to this intensity of mass murder, of just uh, uh, um, a consistent, systemized, mechanized uh, um, uh, uh, murder, in the same, of, of genocide in the same way. Um, it, it, fantasy, he, he he suggests, is another um, another uh, element of anti-Semitism. This is a very interesting one. Um, in other words, the argument that it doesn't involve misinterpretation; it just involves it's completely fantastical. In other words, the, the idea of a blood libel, for example, is is just complete fantasy. And and it's amazing that a fantastical myth can endure in that in that level. Um, and uh, there's like a, a a fantasy and and. Uh, irrationality around it, which is what allows it to uh, to mutate and morph, because it can just always conveniently fit the facts. So uh, I, I guess where we've got to at the end of this session, what, what uh, and, and again, forgive me, I, I normally have philosophy talks stick close to philosophy, I just didn't, didn't feel it, it was appropriate here, um, is we start off by trying to define anti-Semitism. I don't think we've come out with a clear definition, even the terms are problematic. Um, part of the problem is because it morphs and keeps on changing. And, and the most we can say is on a functional level, some of the, the, the sorts of aspects that, that hold it together are, are the longevity, the, the intensity, the, the fantastical nature of it, the permanence, uh, and so on. And I think that's the best we can do. Um, in the next week, we'll look at, at, uh, at what, what we can say hashkafically around this morphing nature. Um, some of these ideas uh, were, were expressed very clearly by Rabbi Sachs, but they're firmly grounded in classic sources, and I'll try and share some of that. Um, so for now, forgive me if, if this was entitled Jewish philosophy, and we haven't particularly touched either on Jewish or philosophical sources yet, but we will, we'll, 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 we'll please go get to them. Sure, what was yeah. the terminology prior to 1879? Um, th it, it, there wasn't there wasn't a unified terminology. So it was often just spoken about as Jew hatred, which someone put forward as 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 a, a better terminology for us to go back to. Um, as sem the reason Semitism was chosen as a term was because it fell into German racial theories around that time. Um, by the way, they're terms that we still use nowadays, which are, are complete nonsense, number one, and driven by profound racism in the origin of the terms. We talk about white people as being Caucasian. Now, why Caucasian? Where does it, right, right, why Caucasian? Why does that come into? And this is the product of, of German biologists and, and pseudo-biologists already then, in which they were they were identifying different races and different groups and so on. And Semites was the 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 the, the, the sort of terminology used for, for Jews. We 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 are aware from Tanakh that we are B'nai shame, but I, I think very few of us go around labeling ourselves as B'nai shame. We're B'nai Yaakov, we're B'nai Yisrael, right? We, 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 we're Jews. Um, the, the, the link to shame was, was actually driven, we are aware that we are from B'nai Shem, right? We've B'nai Avem, B'nai Shem, and we read the Pesukim, we've just been through the Parshias of, uh, of, uh, of Noach, uh, and, and the, the, the sorts of division into families, but it, this, was, this was driven by German racial theories, so it was only at that point that it became a racial feature. I don't think most people in the medieval era would have thought of Jews as a race. I think they would have seen it as a religion. This is, to be a Jew is a certain type of religion. And the odd Jew who converted to uh, Christianity wasn't, it wasn't seen as a racial element. I should emphasize again, because we, 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 for those who are historically aware, I've given an oversimplification because there were other times when it morphed into racism. For example, when you had mass Jewish conversion. And the example of this is in Spain. So um, in Spain, we, we always think of Spain as 1492 and the Inquisition. The truth is already in the 1300s, um, there was intense pressure put on Jews to convert to Christianity. And there were Jews who chose to do so in vast numbers. And um, the Spanish uh, the Spanish population felt overwhelmed, actually, by successful just new converts. They called them new Christians. 
And racial terminology began arising there because they didn't have a religious, convenient religious label to give these converts because they were practicing Christians. So sometimes they, they cast doubt on the authenticity of the Christians. Historically, there's no reason to actually suspect that much doubt. Of. Some of them were, were what we nowadays call Muranos, again, uh, an anachronistic term. But some of them were sincere converts. They had chosen to convert out of convenience and betray our people. But they, they, there's no evidence that they were faking the conversion. Um, nonetheless, and there you began hearing things about Jewish blood contaminating uh, uh, even Christian converts, and the Catholic Church tried to fight this because it's against Christian doctrine, which is that once a Jew converts, they're, they're full, uh, full Christian. Um, in, it's not much spoken about. I, do, I don't think people realize, actually, the, the horrific numbers of um, conversions to Christianity in Germany in the 1800s. The, 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 the dropout rate was, was staggeringly high, unfortunately. We're, we're talking in, 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 in tens of percent, actually, and it's not, it's not much spoken about because it, it was, there was a deep sense of shame for obvious reasons. Um, and again, when there was this mass conversion, that's when uh, it, people began linking it to sort of bloods as opposed to faith. And, and it was, so you can come up with sociological reasons why people would come up with a racist definition at that point. In a sense, one of the reasons, part of what I, I, I will argue next week, and again, it, much of this is expressed very clearly by Rabbi Sachs, is that it, it, on a sociological point of view, it's, it's worrying and scary and strange why anti-Semitism keeps morphing. If one looks at it as a Hashkafic phenomena, as, as a, a transcendent phenomena with, with an aspect of spiritual, spiritual work at play, then maybe we understand why it morphs so much and why it constantly changes. And maybe even what I was saying at the beginning, in which I spoke about indifference isn't necessarily anti-Semitism, ignorance isn't. We don't tick the box of being a classic minority. All of that may be true, but it may also be just a means to understanding, therefore, why anti-Semitism doesn't fit the classic box. It doesn't fit classic explanations, and indeed should be seen as a spiritual phenomena. We'll have to grapple with how to understand it as a spiritual phenomena without ending up shifting too far into blaming the victim also. But pre, pre, um, pre uh, that era, I don't think most Christians would have seen it as, as racial, even though there were flare-ups in which it was seen as a racial uh, thing, such as uh, in Spain in, in the late 1300s. Um, I just want to uh, just check if there's anything online or anything. Um, uh, um, someone wrote here also, maybe this should have been mentioned also, historically it seems that with powerful caste systems rampant across, um, across Europe, um, Jews were the, the most convenient minority to blame. Um, the only power target available to them, the lowest social level, were Jews. So uh, I, I've actually skipped this out, and maybe I, I should have. Uh, this point is important. There were socio-economic reasons why Jews, were, were, why anti-Semitism flared up. Um, Jews were were the closest there was to a middle class in feudal Europe. Um, it, we know, for example, that as Jews moved to East Europe, brought in by the royal families, they were the, often the intermediaries between uh, um, the powers and the peasants. Th there's so much else to say around it, but I, I want to move on back to classic Jewish sources. So, so we'll leave it at this point. And thank you so much, everyone, for for joining. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, I, I think I think that charity begins at home, and there's lots of legitimacy for that. I think we can't carry the weight of the world on our shoulders. There's a limit to resources, but I think sometimes we overstep the mark and remain nonetheless a little too indifferent to it. Yeah. Okay. We'll stop here.